had great speakers this morning with some far-ranging topics. Uh, this morning, we're going to start with Brad Schreiber. Brad's an attorney here in Pier. Uh, does a lot of uh, criminal defense work. And Brad, would you come up and uh, tell us about DUI? Thank you. This is going to be fast, so hold on. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my outlines. Whatever you don't take out from those, you find in the outlines. So that's what it's going to be. Um, one thing, if you're going to have any type of DUI practice, I think there are certain resources you have to have and you have to be acquainted with. One of them is the DWI uh, Detection Manual. This is a manual all law enforcement use. This is one they're trained in. It's put out by <coughs> excuse me, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. The most current one is the 2006 one, which is what this one is. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is anytime we've got uh, attorneys who want to be certified in administering uh, field sobriety tests, if you want a DRE course, um, I've got a guy we can get up here to do that two, three years ago. We did that. About seven, eight of us actually got certified in the administration of field sobriety tests. And we did it right here and here. So we can do that anytime uh, if anybody's interested. But this is the manual. It costs a little bit of money to get it. If you go through the course, it's free. Well, it's not free, but it's free. A couple of the other books that you're going to need that I think are imperative is Garrett's Medical Legal Aspects of Alcohol. This is kind of the Bible for DUI attorneys. Um, it has everything you're going to want to know about alcohol uh, dissipation or uh, the absorption, the elimination throughout the body. It tells you how the potassium oxalate, sodium fluoride is affected. The whole ball of wax is in this one. Um, two other resource books. You should get a good, what they call drug driving defense book. Two of the best attorneys uh, in the nation are William Bubba Hyde, who's an attorney out of Georgia. The other one I'm thinking of is, is uh, Larry Taylor. Steve Oberman, Harley Wagner out of West Virginia. One of the other uh, good ones is Mike Kessler out of Florida. Most of these guys have got books that they've written about DUI defense. This one is written by Bubba Head. He's one of the founders of the National College of DUI Defense. If there's information that you think you need or want, if you go on to the National College of DUI Defense website, it has a ton of information on it. A ton of information about anything from field sobriety tests, from blood testing, from um, things that can contaminate, affect the blood sample itself. But this is Bubba Head's book. Um, if you get Larry Taylor's book, it's also co-authored by Steve Oberman. Yeah, you get updates every year for this one. That's how thick. I mean, we're just not looking at blood tests anymore. I mean, there's a lot to do with DUIs. It's not just looking at a blood test, <coughs> deciding whether or not somebody is guilty um, or, or innocent. I mean, this is how thick the book is, the Bible on DUIs is. That's, it's just not that easy to do anymore. Um, a couple articles that if you haven't read, you should have in your arsenal. One of them comes from Dr. Kurt Dubowski. The article that he has written that um, I think most of the chemists um, are familiar with this article is the absorption, distribution, elimination of alcohol, um, safety, highway, safety, highway safety aspects. This article, I think, was written, I believe, like in 1986. But this, you talk about it, the, um, extrapolation. This is the article most lawyers go to when they want to learn about extrapolation. This is the article everybody talks about. Um, it was published in the Journal of Studies on Alcohol. Um, it, was, it was in 1985 is when it was published. But I strongly recommend you read this, not once, but read it twice. Um, and when you read this, it'd be nice if you had Garrett's alongside you because there's going to be a lot of things you don't understand the first couple of times you go through. Mm -hmm. So you kind of put them together, you can kind of interpret what's going on with the extrapolation. Um, the importance of NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, all the articles that are put on there, um, not that long ago, there was an article that talked about bloodshot and glassy eyes are not clues of impairment. When we see police reports a lot, 
we see bloodshot, glassy eyes as being one of those things that they observe that leads them to believe that somebody might be under the influence of alcohol. NHTSA, uh, actually, and I'm just going to read from this article. It says, finally, some cues were eliminated because they might be indicators more social class and alcohol impairment. For example, officers informed us that a flush to red face might be an indication of a high BAC in some people. However, the Q also is characteristic of agricultural oil, oil field and other outside work. Similarly, bloodshot eyes, while associated with alcohol consumption, also is a trait of many shift workers and people who must work more than one job, as well as those afflicted by allergies. The disheveled appearance similarly is open to subjective interpretation. We attempted to limit the recommendation to clear and objective post-stop behaviors. Um, this was authored by Jack Stuster, Stuster, with the U.S. Department of Transportation, NHTSA. Um, in their final report, the detection of DWI BAC is below 0.10. Um, it was published in 1997. Basically, that whole article says that these are not clues of impairment. So, and this is on the, the NHTSA website, and there are a lot more articles like this on that website. There's a ton of information on there to go through and look at. Um, I'm not going to pass this one around, but I put together, you know, sometimes you got to have the right case when you do your motion for discovery, and sometimes I change it. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, it's pretty standard motion for discovery that I do because it comes right out of a, I still call it red book. Somebody told me a lot long ago, we actually changed the color so it's not the red book, it's the brown book now. Out of a code. But I have a motion for discovery specifically for those DUI cases where I think something else is going on. And my motion for discovery is 7 pages long. That's just for DUI cases. And some of the information, and it's actually been granted, you might think, well, how could you do a seven page motion for discovery in a DUI case? That thing's never gonna get granted. I've had the couple of times that I have actually filed this motion, it's been objected to, it's been granted. Uh, there's been a couple of things on it that have been eliminated. Um, just after I look at it, I don't need the information, so, um, I boiled it down to like 35 different things, but it still takes up seven pages. Um, I'm willing to, uh, off, you know, let somebody else use this, see it, plagiarize it, whatever you want to do. I think it actually is on um, the South Dakota Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers website, if you remember that association. I think once upon a time it got put on, the, put on that website, but I'm not 100% sure. But among the information that I request, if you've never seen one, is a gas chromatograph. Okay, those are, I kind of like to get them, see what's going on with them because what they do is they, they identify the volatile organic compounds that show up in the blood. If you have any idea how a gas chromatograph works, um, what it does is those vol volatile organic compounds are identified on the gas chromatograph, then you get your retention times. And the retention times is how you get the graph, that's what you end up with. Um, those graphs, also are explained and identified in Garrett's uh, Medical Legal Dictionary on Alcohol. Um, the interpretation isn't that tough, but you gotta know what you're looking for because there's always a standard, but you're gonna find uh, things like, uh, for in diabetics, you're gonna find things like acetone might show up in there, okay? Um, one other thing I wanna mention about um, Jewel that was signed in great I've been paying attention to. Three minutes. Plenty of minutes. <laughs> Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, when, when you're doing your discovery, you're investigating a DUI, if you can't get hold of the actual blood test tube, uh, what I try to do is I try to go to the state health lab and take a look at it, because there's a lot of valuable information on that tube. These tubes basically are manufactured by the Becton Dickinson Company out of New Jersey. Uh, they're gray stopper tubes. All of them should be gray stopper tubes. I think now they're 10 milliliter tubes and they're forensic tubes. They used to be just uh, clinical tubes, but now they're uh, forensic tubes. Inside those tubes has got to be potassium oxalate and sodium fluoride. Um, and I'm going to credit George Johnson to do something here a few years ago. George actually had one of these tubes tested at Fort Collins uh, by Rocky Mountain Lab, found out that there wasn't that the amount of sodium fluoride contained within these tubes did not meet the national standard. 
We brought that to the attention of the state health lab. They changed it. They brought it up to the state standard. The importance of sodium chloride is it's a preservative in the blood. Why do we need to preserve the blood? Because bacteria can get in that blood, which can actually cause a fermentation of the blood and start causing alcohol to develop in there. Um, the one thing about the tubes is look for an expiration date. The significance of the expiration date on the tube is if it's expired, then the company does not guarantee the vacuum within the tube. So what's that mean? That means that it's subject to contamination and then you've got the whole um, um, problem with, with the fermentation of the blood. Or at least you've got an argument that can go on there. The biggest, um, the most, the one bacteria that can create the biggest problem is candida, all the, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But if your blood is contaminated with that particular bacteria, then you've really got a fermentation process. But there's only one lab in the country that I know of that can actually test for sodium fluoride, and that's the lab in Fort Collins. Potassium oxalate is an anticoagulant, and that's all it is. The importance, one minute. The importance of the potassium oxalate in the coagulation is, is it allows the blood not to coagulate and then separate out into the red blood cells in the serum or plasma. What, what can happen is, if it does, you can have a higher concentration of alcohol if only that serum or, or the plasma ends up getting tested as opposed to the entire whole blood. So that's the danger that it creates. That's why we have to know those things. Um, the other thing, and I'm just going to point out at the bottom of my incredible outline, I talked about diabetes and gastroparesis. I can't even say it right. You might want to read that. I just learned about it not that long ago. It's when the body does, or it's when the stomach does not get rid of all of the, the, the contents of it is what it does. And what that means is when somebody's driving, they have a, if they haven't expelled all the contents, you could end up having a, a false high BAC later on when the blood is tested if the, if the body empties its contents. So that's it. I'm done. Thanks.
Um, one in five minutes online per day is spent on social networks. Um, 140 million active users on Twitter. Uh, if, even if you don't use social media, it's very important to know that it's where, it's there, it's prevalent, and more than likely your clients are using it. So kind of going back to thinking of how to use and how to frame social media, you need to prepare beforehand. You need to prepare before your client comes into your office. Know what social media is and what's out there. Think of the case types that you normally get. Family law is big, and those of you that do practice in family law, you know that Facebook is probably one of the highest, or one of the reasons for divorce. Uh, people are finding their old high school sweethearts, they're doing, uh, you know, they're, they're corresponding privately, they're finding people that they you know, haven't seen in years. Um, Facebook is huge in family law. Um, the types of social media information, some of it's obvious, pictures, videos, correspondence. Um, some that may be not so obvious would be date and time stamps, especially for alibi, uh, criminal defense. If someone was, is tweeting, a lot of times they have a geotag of where they're located, latitude, longitude. It could be a potential alibi for, you know, if, the, if, if your client has been accused of a burglary and being in a certain spot at, at a certain time, if they are affiliated with social networking and they're tweeting and the geotag has them somewhere else, perfect alibi. Think outside the box when you're thinking of social media. Uh, and when you look under the purpose category, you can, be, you can use it for a whole host of different things. Even if it isn't um, trying to create an alibi for, for a defense client, um, you can shape the credibility of uh, opposing counsel's witnesses. Um, you can look at the broader timeline of events. How did this happen? Who are the people that this person knows? What is their contact list? Who are their friends? What's their motive? Um, and then also, you know, fact finding. Who are the jurors um, that are potentially sitting on your trial uh, opposing counsel? Uh, I think every time that Dan and I get a phone call from someone that we don't know, the first thing we do is Google their name, see what pops up, see the picture, and kind of do a little bit of background. If you're not doing that, you're missing out on a lot of great information about the people that are calling in your potential clients. All right, so getting to the discovery issues. Um, social media information is discoverable. Um, a lot of lawyers that hate social media, they're going to raise the red flags and they're going to say, no, it's private. They put those privacy setting up. You know, we don't want to go through the, through the work. And it's online. We don't even know how to get our hands on it. I don't want to subpoena Facebook. I don't want to do any of those things. They're going to throw a lot of red herrings. When you get to the meat and potatoes of it, it is discoverable. It's correspondence, and if it meets the broad standard of, of a piece of paper document or anything else, there's no determinative difference. You don't treat social media information any, any different than anything else that is discoverable, as long as you can meet those burdens. And of course, up top, social media is kind of, it falls under the umbrella of electronic discovery. All right, so I, I just discussed privacy settings. Um, in the outline, I discuss a couple of different viewpoints that the courts have had over the course of the last couple of years as social media has become more important and information has been uh, valuable to the people looking for it. Um, courts have said, you know, if people put privacy settings on their information, they're inherently trying to hide that information. Other courts say, no, it's social media. People aren't putting stuff on the internet just to share it with themselves. It doesn't make much sense that way. Privacy settings do a couple of different things. Um, it makes the person feel comfortable with sharing their information, but it also will stop the lawyer in their tracks of sleuthing on their own. So it's very important that if, if you are doing your own um, sleuthing on, on your computer and you can't get to the information that you think is relevant, don't. It's an ethical obligation to not try and uh, try to be someone else, get your legal assistant to friend the other person to, to get to that information. That's a barrier that's, that's real, but it doesn't mean that you can't at some point get to that information behind it. A um, couple of great quotes. One of my favorite is, in this environment, privacy is no longer grounded in reasonable expectations, but rather in some theoretical protocol of wishful thinking. Privacy settings do no more in, except for um, kind of stopping your tracks and doing your own solution. Um, kind of the biggest part in this entire presentation is when to start thinking and when to start asking about social media. 
You need to do it at your intake interview. And that's for, for multiple different purposes. You need to save your own butt and your client's butt, but at the same time, that's when you can start doing your own sleuthing. At that point in time, there's probably still a lot of public information in your opposing client's case that you can go and take a screenshot so you know that that information at least existed at one point. So that in your intake interview, and if you're looking at the outline, there are a couple of different things, to, and, and that's just a snapshot. Um, you know, figure out for your own client, what kind of devices do they use? Do they use an iPad? Do they use a smartphone? Do they, you know, use uh, applications on the internet? Get their usernames and passwords. Um, and you need to preserve all of the social media information that your client has. You've got that duty to preserve anything that is relevant that could potentially discoverable in the future for the, op the opposing side. That duty relies on both yourself and opposing counsel, and it includes social media. Um, meet and confer, it, it, it's interesting. When I talk to lawyers, I say, you know, have you, when you go to your meet and confer conference, do you discuss social media? Do you discuss how to, you know, how to save it, how to protect it, all of those sort of things? A lot of people say, I don't even talk to the other side. I don't want to talk to them until I send them interrogatories. It's too late. By that time, the volatile data in social media has probably either been hidden, deleted, spoliated with some sort of way. So make sure that you ask at the beginning. Uh, and also know that people, there are third-party vendors out there that can track um, people's Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, and updates, and provide and kind of track throughout the litigation process. So if it's a medical malpractice case, personal injury case, if you're wanting to see if they're posting pictures of themselves, uh, status updates, one of those things, that it is possible to be tracked or tracked during that time. I didn't even get to the issue considerations, but a lot of it is already affiliated in the outline. If you have any questions, if you, if you need anything at all, please call me, send me an email. It's a very interesting part of the law, but you can't ignore it. You need to make sure that you preserve it and that you actually do your due diligence and educate yourself in social media and electronic discovery. Thanks.
but the lawyers on the other side want these records. And the second thing she said, if these records are disclosed, I am seriously concerned about the consequences to my clients, mental or physical well-being. So that's how I kind of got interested in this particular uh, area of psycho, um, psychotherapy or psychotherapist records. We start out South Dakota law, it's in the, it's in the materials. Uh, we have basic privileges that under statute, uh, the medical privilege, the psychotherapist privilege. Naturally, if you make the issue of your emotional state or your physical state at issue in a lawsuit, the law says uh, for all intents and purposes, you waive that privilege. Under federal law, up until 1996 in the Jaffe case, uh, the issue of psychotherapist privilege had not been addressed. It had been, um, through the rules of uh, uh, evidence and the rules of the civil procedure, had been potentially discovered, had been discussed as a potential privilege by the advisory committees. One of the problems is, is that um, the federal law, unless it's statutory, can only resort to the federal common law. And so when they, when the 